This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. That though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one Let all the house of Israel therefore know for the certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, And with that many other worlds, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there, and there were about 3,000 added to that day of souls. Here's my own prayer. My Father, we come for you this morning. I want to thank you for everything you've done for us. You're, you are the creator and ruler of the heavens and earth and everything that's in them. You are, you are the one true God. We come this morning to remember, to worship you and remember your son and the sacrifice of your son enables us to have the hope and the promise of eternal life with you in the end. Lord, we pray... Uh, for those of our number who are ill today, we pray that you'll be with them and the people caring for them and, and the ones that are undergoing treatments. We pray that the people caring for them will have the talent, the knowledge to do what they need to and, and they'll have full recovery. We also want to pray that, that this coronavirus that is going around, we pray that it will end soon and we'll be able to return to normal and we'll be able to come together worship you as one again be with be with us as we 
worship and, and study your word today. And we pray that we'll take this, put it in our hearts, and use it in the coming week to further your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. From Pentecost, working backwards to Passover, is seven weeks. In the Old Testament, the name for Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks. But by the first century, it had been given a Greek name, Pentecost, meaning the 50th. And so it was 50 days from Passover to Pentecost. Seven weeks plus one day. When you think about it, this is our seventh week of doing this by means of Facebook. And so it was the second week in March when we had to go to online services because of the uh, pandemic. And so picture yourself being seven weeks removed from the crucifixion of our Lord and the resurrection of himself from the dead. Acts chapter 2 has been called the central hub of the Bible. And by that we mean that everything from Genesis 1 all the way to Acts 1 points to the events that are going to happen in Acts chapter 2. God had hid within his heart back in eternity his plan to redeem lost humanity, including you and me. And so Acts 2 is where the gospel is going to be presented for the very first time. The heart of the Bible is Jesus. The crucifixion is the apex of the Bible. But Acts chapter 2 is the central hub because this is the first time that men are going to hear the gospel proclaimed. Jesus died to provide remission of sins for the entire world. Acts chapter 2 tells how the saving blood of our Lord can be appropriated to the souls of lost men. But from Acts chapter 3 to the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, everything written after Acts 2 points backward to the event of Acts chapter 2. And what is written afterwards was written because of what God did in intervening on this very significant day. The Jews had several religious festivals or several religious holidays. Two very significant holidays were in the springtime, Passover and Pentecost. And in the fall of their calendar, the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of the Tabernacles, where they would uh, build temporary shelters and they would live in those shelters for an entire week. According to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, three times a year, every Jewish male was required to go wherever God had placed his name, and they were to meet God in worship. They were not to meet God empty-handed. They were to come there and to offer a sacrifice. And so three times a year, twice in the spring and once in the fall, Jewish families would pack things up and would make a trip to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
the city of David, the city where our Lord was crucified and raised, the city where God's name was placed, the temple. Normally, Jerusalem has a population of about 40,000 people. But if we are believed the words of the Jewish historian Josephus, three times a year, Jerusalem swelled with 2.7 million people, according to Josephus. That's taking Columbia, Tennessee, with its population of 40, 40,000, and multiplying it 70 times, which is the approximate size of the city of Chicago, Illinois. So millions of people are in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and God is about to do something spectacular to gain the attention of lost people who are going to be able to hear the gospel for the very first time. On the day of Pentecost, God sent the sound of a rushing, like as a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't a wind. The, there's kind of a, a double comparison right there, like as of a rushing mighty wind. A simile, the sound, the sound of the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And then appearing above the heads of the 12 apostles are split tongues of fire. They are also gathered together. They're at the temple. And so there's a sound. There is something that people can see. And then the apostles begin speaking in tongues, in languages they have not studied. And the people who are witnessing this, who are hearing this, who are seeing this, who are understanding this, exclaim, these men are Galileans. How is it that they're speaking in the language in which we were born? You see, Jews from all over the Roman Empire had come to Jerusalem to meet God. You might say that Acts chapter 2 is Genesis chapter 10 reversed. In Genesis 10, they build the Tower of Babel. They're going to make a name for themselves. They're rooted by pride, and God comes down, investigates, and he multiplies their tongues in order to scatter them over the face of the earth. But now in Acts chapter 2, that is reversed. The language of the gospel, the language of God's passionate love for lost men is now poured out, and men are able to hear and to see and to understand the gospel. When people saw and heard these miracles that God is doing on this day, they gather to investigate. They are amazed. This means they are in a mild state of shock. They are absolutely astonished. They marveled. They were amazed. They were perplexed. They had no understanding of what is happening. They had no way of putting it into a box to logically connect the dots and have an explanation for what this means. They were confounded. They were confused. What does this mean? And some even mocked. They said, well, these men are full of sweet wine. The Greek word there is glucose. Glucose doesn't intoxicate. They're making a joke. And Peter, in a very good nature, he dismisses that. We're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Normally, people who got intoxicated did so in the afternoon and in the evening. But Peter stands with the eleven. Motivated by the Holy Spirit, instructed by God's Spirit, he begins to explain the meaning of the miracle, the miracle of sound, the miracle of sight, the miracle of understanding, of hearing the wonderful works of God explained in various foreign languages, the languages that these Jewish people could understand because it was a language of their birth, their native tongue. Peter says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He's showing that this miracle is fulfilling a prophecy that was 600 years prior and given to the Jewish people. He then quotes Joel chapter 28, chapter 2, verse 28 through verse 32. And if you look in Acts 2, 21, you can see where he quotes the prophet Joel. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
If Peter had to come up with the title for his sermon, his sermon could be entitled, Calling Upon the Name of the Lord. He's going to tell men how they might be able to do it. Joel had predicted that this would be outpoured and that men would be able to call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved. But then after Peter explains the meaning of this miracle, he then moves to a central topic, Jesus of Nazareth. He points out that Jesus had God's approval. How so? Because Jesus was able to do numerous miracles by the powers of God. These miracles prove that what he was doing had God's blessing and approval. This means that what Jesus taught was the truth from heaven itself, from God's own Holy Spirit. And so Jesus had been put to the test by these miracles. R.C. Trench, in his landmark book, All the Miracles of the Bible, lists 37 miracles that Jesus did in his ministry. Later, John would write, after selecting eight miracles, seven prior to the resurrection, then the resurrection, then the, the miraculous catch of fish in John 21, he says, these are written that you might believe in his name, and in believing in his name, you might have eternal life. He then uses hyperbole. He said, of all the miracles Jesus ever did, if they were written about, why, the whole world couldn't contain the works or couldn't contain the miracles, the miraculous works that Jesus had done. So, Je so Jesus was a God-approved man. Jesus did these miracles in the midst of these very people who are now gathered on the day of Pentecost. And Peter says, you yourselves, you know of these things. And then Peter says, you crucified this same Jesus. The you is plural. You by the hand of wicked and lawless men. By lawless men, does he mean men without law? That is the Gentiles. And that is true, that the Gentiles took a part in the crucifixion of the Lord, but they did so because they were motivated by Jewish leaders who manipulated them into doing so. Peter then says that God foresaw this crucifixion. This was part of God's determinate counsel. God predecided, God predetermined that this was going to happen, that he was going to use the rebellion of men, their unbelief, that of their murder of an innocent man, their manipulation of law, that God was going to use that to do something wonderful. Satan takes good things and he makes something bad out of it. Only God can take bad things and make something good to come out of it. In the murder of the Son of God, our Father has done something magnificent. And so when we face circumstances that are painful, when we are the objects of unjust criticism, when we become the victim of a crime, we too can put our faith in God, that God will use that for His own glory, and God will make something magnificently wonderful to come out of that. Peter says that it was impossible for death to retain its hold on Jesus. Why? Because God had made a promise. But God had predicted through the prophets the resurrection of his son. These scriptures predicted the resurrection, and God's will cannot be successfully withstood. Then Peter speaks of a man that all Jewish people revere. Like not only Jews, Christians revere this man. Muslims revere this man. David, a man after God's own heart, a man who was raised by God to do the will of God, a man who made mistakes but was honest about those mistakes. In Psalm 16, David predicted the resurrection that Jesus' heart would be glad and his tongue would rejoice. Why? David says, because God would not leave the soul of Jesus in Hades. How was he going to do that? He was going to raise Jesus from the dead. 
David not only predicted the resurrection of the Son of God, he predicted the coronation. He predicted that in 2 Samuel when Nathan the prophet came and gave these words. David will later write about this in Psalm 132. And then he would write about it in Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until you make all your enemies the footstool for your feet. The Lord has made an oath and will not relent. You are a priest after the order of of Melchizedek. Jesus was raised to life, raised to be a king, raised not only to be a king, raised to be a priest. And then Peter says, David wasn't talking about himself. David's tomb is with us to this day. You can go to Jerusalem and you can visit the traditional uh, location where David supposedly was buried. And then the lower right-hand corner of this sign in Hebrew Kaber David Hamelech, which in Hebrew says the tomb of David the king. David wasn't talking about himself because David has not yet been raised from the dead. No, David was talking about someone else. Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, born of a virgin, worshiped by angels perform miraculous deeds. And then Jesus selected 12 to walk with him, to be with him, to eat with him, to be eyewitnesses of his majesty and his glory, to be witnesses to his death, to his burial, but more significantly, witnesses to his resurrection. Peter says on the day of Pentecost, we saw him. After Jesus arose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples, not once. If it was a one-time appearance, people might begin to doubt. Well, I mean, I thought he appeared to me, but maybe I was mistaken. No, not once, not twice, not three times. The Bible says for a space of 40 days, Jesus appeared and Jesus spoke and he taught things concerning the kingdom of God. That's how the book of Acts opens. And apparently that's Luke's theme of the book of Acts, the kingdom of God, because he begins with that idea. Jesus speak, appearing and speaking for 40 days, teaching about the things of the kingdom of God. And in chapter 28, we find Paul in Rome, speaking to Jewish people, speaking about the very same topic, the kingdom of God. Peter would say in Acts 2.32, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we 12 were witnesses. There were multiple appearances. There were multiple witnesses. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, why didn't the Jewish Sanhedrin, why didn't the Sadducees, who denied there was a resurrection, why didn't they just wheel Jesus' corpse right there next to the temple and call Peter and the other apostles liars. He hadn't been raised from the dead. You didn't see a resurrected uh, man. Here's his body right here. Why didn't they produce his corpse? The reason is there was no corpse. The reason is the tomb was empty. The reason is God had raised Jesus from the dead. And the prophets had foretold that this would happen. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on this day was proved visually and auditorially and intellectually that God is doing something great. And what these people are hearing and seeing and understanding is from God. Then Peter says, after quoting Psalm 110, he says, God has made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They were cut to the heart. There's despair in their heart. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter says unto them, repent. Let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ 
for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children and to all Jewish people who are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. That last phrase gets you and me, the Gentiles. We are included within the boundary of that promise that we can call on the name of the Lord. Peter had began, begun his sermon by quoting the prophet Joel that God was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh and young men and young women would prophesy. Old men would dream dreams. People would see visions. There would be miracles done. The sun was going to turn to blood or was, go, was going to go dark. The moon was going to turn to blood. The stars from the heavens would fall before that great and terrible day of the Lord. But whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter tells them on the day of Pentecost about the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is Jesus. And he shows them, he explains to them what it means to call on the name, to repent and be baptized. The promise given to them is they shall be saved, which is another way of saying they will have remission or forgiveness of sins. Yesterday morning, I got a call from my father who told me that one of my first cousins who was diagnosed with a form of cancer went through pretty radical treatment, stem cell procedure. For a while, he really didn't have an immune system. But my father said, I want you to know, he is now disease-free. His disease is in remission. When a, disease, when a disease goes into remission, what happens? It goes away. And the phrase remission of sins, remission there is the idea of sending them away. They're gone. The prophet Micah had said in Micah chapter 7, verse 18, that will take all of our sins and cast them into the bottom or into the depths of the ocean. The people were right to ask, what shall we do? And folks, today we should ask, what does God want us to do? When we hear what they heard and we obey what they obeyed, we receive the same benefits and promises that they received. What were they told to do? Two commandments. Repent, which means a turning away, a change of mind that involves a change in lifestyle, and then baptism. Later, Saul of Tarsus would be told, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Baptism is not a savior, Jesus is the Savior. Repentance is not a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Faith is not a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. But faith and repentance and baptism are those things that God requires of us. He incentivizes these commandments. He gives us a reason to obey him. He says, if you will be obedient, I will give you remission of sins and I will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is thought to be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, much more than just salvation, but it's the gift of the Spirit indwelling each of us, being a down payment on God's promise to give us eternal life when the world comes to an end. We're told that Simon Peter, with many other words, he testified and he, he exhorted. He appealed to their intellect. 
to their emotion and to their will. He said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. A wicked generation is deserving of God's judgment. He's telling them how they can call on the name of the Lord so that they can be saved. And so on this day, these people received pardon. Intellectually, they understood that Jesus had been crucified seven weeks earlier and that God had raised him from the dead, that there were multiple witnesses, there were multiple appearances, that the tomb had been guarded by Roman soldiers, and they had fainted dead away. Later, many of them would learn, many Jews would learn, that Jewish authorities had bribed them to say, well, we were asleep. But if they were asleep, how could they say, well, the disciples stole the body? A sleeping witness? Tell us, tell the court, good sir, what you saw, what you were eyewitness. Well, I was asleep. Well, tell us what you saw. Well, if you're asleep, you don't see anything. Pardon was promised to these people. Thus began a new way of living. And the Bible says, Luke says, they continued steadfastly in a number of activities as a part of this new way of living. They continued with the apostles' teaching. They continued to remain students. They were intellectually curious. They wanted to understand more and more what it meant to have a Savior like Jesus Christ. They continued in fellowship. They joined with other Christians to share to work together, to worship together. They shared the breaking of bread, which in this context, in this verse, it's an act of worship. Later, there's another breaking of bread, Christians meeting together. But here it's the sacred meal, the breaking of bread. And then they continued steadfastly in the prayers. What happened next? Fear came, up, came over the people who lived in Jerusalem a fear that God was active, a fear that God was working in the lives of so many people. There were miracles that were done, special miracles done by even Simon Peter. These miracles provided evidence that God's approval was on these 12 men. The church continued in fellowship with one another, meeting together privately and then meeting together publicly. The church continued to be generous acts of charity, service to others. But this was the action of God working to save men. There's a possibility that some of the people who are watching this on Facebook are not in a right relationship with God. And you have a choice to make. You can accept what God says or you can reject God. In the 1800s, when Elizabeth Barrett fell in love with another poet, her soulmate, Robert Browning, they married. Her father disowned her. And in the months that followed, she wrote dozens of letters to her father pleading for reconciliation. But he refused to open any of her letters. And when he died, all of those unopened letters were returned to her. He had spurned his own daughter. We can spurn the love of God. Acts chapter 2 stands as witness to the love of God, the passion of God for our salvation, the great desire of God that we have fellowship with Him. And Acts chapter 2 delineates how we can do this. I read recently of uh, the Duck Dynasty guy, Phil Robertson, He's a brother in Christ. He's an elder in the Lord's church. He is very evangelistic. He tells of the day that he was at his house and a vehicle drove up and a young man got out. Phil Robertson said he was a redneck. And so this redneck, his girlfriend, and then the redneck's mother, they had driven to the Robertson house because they had spiritual questions and they were speaking seeking spiritual guidance. So Phil privately asked the boy if he and his girlfriend were living together. 
His face turned red, and he lowered his head in shame, and he nodded yes. And then Brother Robertson made this statement. The Bible calls that sin. But let me tell you the good news of the one who can forgive all your sins, who can raise you to a new life and solve your biggest problem, which is death. And so they went in the house. They sat down, and Phil presented the gospel to the redneck and to his girlfriend and to her mother, or his mother, rather. When he had finished teaching them, they went outside. They said, we want to be baptized. Can we be baptized? And they pointed toward the Wachita River. And so they went down into the water, and Phil Robertson baptized them. When he brought that young man up out of the water, he whispered to him. He said, you're a new creature now. And this means you can't live with that pretty girl. You need to marry her. Do you understand? Phil said that young man smiled. He didn't say anything. He walked over to that girl. He dropped to one knee, and right there in Louisiana, he asked that young lady, will you marry me? And she said yes. Then the young man said to Phil Robertson, on our way home, we're going to find a justice of the peace. We're going to make it official. Phil said, well, I can make a phone call and get a wedding license. We can make it official right here. And so they did. Two people who had been living in sin are now living a new life, having their sins forgiven, now joining hands before God and other witnesses to live together as husband and wife. God can forgive all of our sins. In Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 24, Jesus teaches about the commitment we need to have to him if we're going to be his disciples. He said, if any man would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and keep following me. For whoever will lose his life or will save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what shall a man be profited if he gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? Are you committed to Almighty God? Are you committed to worship? Do you have the joy of the Lord? Are you living a kind of life that brings favor upon the people of God within the community? Are you leading people to salvation? Are you leading people to the Lord? We need to be committed. One of our elders, Brother Terry Gross, He's going to issue an invitation, and I invite you to listen to this man of God as he's calling for a response, and he's showing you what you can do to please God. In Matthew 11, chapter, verses 28 and 29, about the same Jesus Doug has just talked to us about, we see his invitation. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We're living in odd times, and we're not able to worship together as a church family. And although I'm so appreciative that we have this means through technology to be able to be with you today, not being able to physically worship in this uh, building, it's been hard. I wish we could all be here today. I miss the blending of our voices together to praise God and commune with one another because we know as Christians, we're on a journey toward heaven and we need the prayers of each other. We the elders ask for your continual patience and prayer so that we soon can meet as a church family and worship in our classes. But even though we have these obstacles, 
The Lord's invitation is never hindered. It's always been available as long as one is living on the earth. And if you've been touched with this message and know your relationship with God is, is not what it should be, and have fallen away from God, and you need prayers, or you want prayers for some other need or for someone else, we ask that you will get in touch with us. We have a slide behind me that gives the church office's number and it has the um, email and the website. And you also have on this slides the name of us elders here and our phone numbers. And, and we do want to help you in any way that we can. If, if you, from this message, you realize, as we saw that example at the last part of the lesson, that you're not a child of God, and you aren't, aren't saved, and you haven't been washed in the blood of Christ, and you haven't obeyed the gospel, we pray and we beg you to get in touch with us and help us assist you. And I don't care what time of day it is or, uh, or night that it is, if you have that urge and you want to be able to come to the Lord and obey him, come any time, get in touch with us at any time and we'll be able to, glad to assist you in any way to do that. Now let's prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. from Philip, Philip, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those of earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Going to re read in verse 8, he said, He humbled himself 
and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And that's what this supper uh, pertains to, that obedience that he had, the love that he had for us. And as we gather together across this city across the world on the first day of the week that we sit back and do as a, what he did as a commandment, gave us as a commandment to remember him in this way. And as we think about his life and the obedience he had and the way that he was treated on that day when he was led to the cross, the outpouring of hate, the outpouring of screams, of hatred, the beatings that he took, the blood that was falling down from his body and out, out of his body. The way that Jesus, could you imagine the look on Jesus' face as he was walking through and looking into the eyes of the people that he walked past? Thinking about the love that he, was, he had for us to go through all of that. At this time, let's go to prayer and thank him so much for that sacrifice and that obedience and the love that he had for us to, to go through that for us. And as we take of the bread that represents that body that was, that was beaten and torn and shredded for us and for our sins, let's go to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Thank you so much for the obedience he had for you, the love that he had for you, the love that he had for us to follow your will and to do the things that he needed to do to be able to give us the opportunity to live with you in heaven. And as we take this bread that represents that body, help us to do it in a mind and a matter of pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son again, for the life that he lived, all the things that he did while he was here, proving the fact that he was your son and our Savior. Thank you so much for the blood that he shed on that cross. This is the very same blood that gives us the remissions of our sins that we can be in heaven with you. And as we take of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood, please let us take it with that in mind and that we will never forget the pain and the agony, but also never forget the love that he gave us and the love that he showed for you to be in obedient to you and your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been blessed so much in this country. And as we take the time to thank God for all the blessings of life, we thank him for this country that we are able to live in and we're able to work and provide fam uh, work money for our families. At this time, we just want to be able to go to God and Father and and thank him for all these blessings that we do have. And we appreciate the uh, contribution 
um, that you can still give through mailing in or you can you know drop it off at the church office even though that we're not meeting together there's one thing I know for a fact and that this church is still working hard there's a lot of things that are getting done there's a lot of mission work that is being done and there's only one the only way that we can get all that stuff done is but through the contribution and this church has always given to it hurts it's unbelievable how how giving this family is here at white bluff and i just want to say thank you for the body here that we can do so much and i just hope that you know god always keeps us going and we are blessed through these contributions and that his word is continually pushed throughout the world. At this time, let's go back to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again so much for this country. Thank you so much for the leaders here, and please bless them. And as they lead us, please help them to always look for you first. Consider you in their decisions on what you would have them do. Please be with those that are sick. Please be with those that are working with those that are sick. Please bless them. Please bless the money that uh, we get in contribution that we can further your word throughout this community and throughout the world. Thank you so much for everything that you do for us that can be seen and that can't be seen. We know that you're working behind the scenes all the time and we want to say thank you for all of those things that we can't see. But we know that your blessing, your blessings just overpour everything. Please go with us through the week until we have a chance to meet back with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we close with prayer this morning, I'd like to read the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. 
Peter writes this epistle to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, and he ends with these words of comfort. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do recognize that you have dominion over all things. You are our strength, our comfort, our hope, and our peace, our trust. We thank you so much for the way you bless us in all things, ways that we don't, do not even know. Father, we pray this morning for all people in all places that you would bring comfort and healing and peace to all who are suffering with this pandemic. We pray that you would bring this scourge to swift conclusion that we might be back in our country, in our community, back in our normal way of life again. But especially, Father, your church might be able to re reassemble together in worship as we so desire to do, that we might enjoy the fellowship that you've established for us. Father, thank you so much for the church we have, and we just pray for all those of our members, be it all those who are suffering with illness, with being confined, just pray that you'd bless them, help us to be a comfort as well. Father, be with us each and every moment of every day. Help us to live our lives according to your will, to continue shining the light of Jesus to those we come in contact with. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.